Hello, hello, welcome to Rachel Paints Poorly. My name is Rachel and I paint poorly. Today, I'm going to be painting Jean-Michel Basquiat's Dos Cabezas, originally painted in 1982. Basquiat is a unique artist so far for the channel in several ways. First, chronologically speaking, he is the most recent artist. He was born in December of 1960 and his first public exhibition took place in 1980. Of the previous artists, only Mary Blair was also born in the 20th century. Second, Jean-Michel received no formal artistic education. This is not to say that he was uneducated. Indeed, his mother took him to the Brooklyn Museum of Art early in his childhood, and he attended both private and public schools, including City S School in 1976, which was a school for gifted and talented students. While he dropped out a year before his graduation, his highly educated background is still apparent in the layers and imagery found in his works, with references to artists such as Leonardo da Vinci and Vincent van Gogh, history and culture, blues and jazz, and one of his favorite authors, Mark Twain. Third, Jean-Michel's artistic oeuvre is unlike the other artists previously discussed to this point, though there are some similarities that can be teased out if we so desire. For example, on the surface, Jean-Michel's works can look childlike. He told a friend, quote, I want to make paintings that look as if they were made by a child, end quote. Likewise, the art of Mary Blair is often referenced as being childlike. He also used everyday found items in his work, painting on bits of foam and even a friend's refrigerator, and stretching his canvases over pallets and pieces of wood, similar to attempts by Pablo Picasso to work non-traditional items like sand and metal into his pieces. For the most part, however, his work is actually quite singular compared to our previous paintings, and I actually spent a lot of time just sitting and looking at the pieces instead of, you know, doing research like I initially intended. So who was Jean-Michel Basquiat, and how did he come to create Dos Cabezas? Jean-Michel Basquiat was born on December 22, 1960, at Brooklyn Hospital in New York, to Gerard Basquiat, an accountant originally from Haiti, and Matilda Andrades, whose parents were from Puerto Rico. The family lived in Brooklyn. Two younger sisters were born in 1963 and 1967, respectively. His father said, quote, He was always so bright, absolutely an unbelievable mind. He drew and painted all his life from the time he was three or four years old. End quote. In May of 1968, Jean, as he was known to his friends, was playing in the street when he was hit by a car. He sustained serious injuries, a broken arm, internal injuries, and he needed his spleen removed. While recovering in the hospital, his mom brought him a copy of Grey's Anatomy. The book had a lasting impression on him, in naming his band Grey, for which he played the clarinet and the synthesizer, and the medical and anatomical imagery found in his artistic works. After his parents separated, Jean remained with his father and sisters. The family moved to Puerto Rico in 1974, before returning to Brooklyn in 1976. Upon attending City as school, Jean met classmate Al Diaz, a graffiti artist. The two collaborated on Jean's character, Samo, short for Same Old Shit, whose career consists of peddling a fake religion. Samo's tags began appearing around Lower Manhattan, including phrases, quotables, and observations, much more than the typically seen name or street name done in those large balloon letters. In June of 1978, at the age of 17, Jean left his father's house. He fell into a group known as the Downtown 500, consisting of about 500 artists of varying sorts who lived and partied from the Lower Bowery District and Lower Manhattan. Eschewing day jobs, the group strove to eke out a living through their art. To make money, Jean began selling painted postcards and t-shirts, even going into a restaurant where Andy Warhol was eating in order to sell his wares. Warhol purchased some postcards. By the end of 1978, there was a growing interest around New York about the identity of Samo. On December 11th, the Village Voice published an article announcing the identities of Jean and Al, although it only used their first names. Jean also announced his identity at several parties with the Downtown 500. Al Diaz said, quote, Jean-Michel saw Samo as a vehicle. The graffiti was an advertisement for himself. All of a sudden, he just started taking it over." End quote. The two would end their collaboration shortly after the article, and the tag, Samo is dead, began showing up on Soho walls. Although often associated with graffiti and street art, actual graffiti artists, as well as Jean-Michel himself, did not consider him to be a graffiti artist. Graffiti artist and friend Rameltree said, quote, Jean-Michel is the one they told, you must draw it this way and call it black man folk art, when it was really white man folk art that he was doing. We were called graffiti artists. He wasn't. End quote. Indeed, initial speculation was that a white conceptual artist was behind Samo. 
on the persistence of those labeling him as a graffiti artist and focusing more on his personality than on his art, Jean-Michel stated, quote, They're just racist, most of these people. They talked about graffiti endlessly, which I don't really consider myself to be a graffiti artist, you know? So they have this image of me, wild man running, you know, wild monkey man, whatever the fuck they think, end quote. While he wasn't a street artist, Jean-Michel incorporated everyday objects and words that he came across in his art, such as abandoned windows and doors, mirrors, and old boards. For example, a 1981 piece featuring a representation of a car and the word varios on a piece of foam he found on the street was included in the February 1981 New York New Wave exhibition that led to Jean-Michel's breakthrough. In May, he traveled to Europe for the first time, for his first one-man show taking place at the Galleria d'Arte Emilio Mazzoli in Modena, Italy, where his work was shown under the name Samo. His first solo exhibition in the United States occurred in March 1982 at the Anina Nosai Gallery. Nosai had become Jean-Michel's primary art dealer the previous year, and she arranged for him to have a studio space in the basement of her gallery, as well as money for art supplies. He would leave her gallery in May 1983, when Bruno B. Schaffberger became his primary art dealer. A collaborator of Andy Warhol's, Bruno suggested a formal meeting between the two artists in the fall of 1982. In an interview with art historian Dieter Buchhardt, Bruno said, quote, I knew Basquiat was fascinated by Warhol, his art, and his ideas. When I suggested a meeting to Basquiat, he was all excited about the prospect. I remember how Warhol reacted to my suggestion. Are you sure he's a really important artist like the other ones you suggested to me? And I said to him, a very special one. It was this meeting with Andy Warhol that led to Jean-Michel Basquiat's creation of Dos Cabezas. And so without further ado, let's get started, shall we? I never really know how to describe my work except maybe, I don't know. I don't know how to describe my work cause it's not always the same thing. It's like somebody asking Miles Davis, how does your horn sound? I don't think he could really tell you why he played. You know, why he plays this at this point in the music. You know, you're just, you're sort of on automatic most of the time. When I work, I'm usually in front of the television. I have to have some sort of material around me to work off. Magazines, textbooks, Jean-Michel Basquiat. Andy Warhol agreed to meet with Jean-Michel. Of this official introduction, Bruno Bischoffberger said, quote, I went to the factory with Basquiat and introduced them to one another officially. Warhol then took a lot of photographs and Basquiat asked if he could take one too, using the very same Polaroid camera. After he shot a few, Basquiat asked Warhol whether I could take a photograph of the two of them. I shot five or six. Basquiat took one of them and then excused himself, saying he had to go. After an hour or two, Basquiat's assistant, Stephen Torton, came back with a painting that was still wet. He had to walk the eight blocks from the studio because the picture didn't fit in a taxi. I could see that Warhol was quite surprised at how well Basquiat had been able to do the painting in such a brief period of time. Smiling, he then said, I'm really jealous. He's faster than me. I noticed that Warhol was quite struck by the work. Not long after, he hung it on the second floor of his home." End quote. The two began their collaboration in 1984. From 1984 to 1985, Jean-Michel created more than 140 works with Andy, which in total make up over one-tenth of his overall painted pieces. Of their working relationship, Jean-Michel's friend and fellow artist Keith Haring recounted that it was, quote, a kind of physical conversation happening in paint instead of words. Andy loved the energy with which Jean-Michel would totally eradicate one image and enhance another. They worked on many canvases at the same time, each idea inspiring the next. Like in his own works, Jean-Michel would add to and paint over Andy's creations, expanding on the piece while leaving hints and glimpses at what was underneath. In an interview, Jean-Michel stated that, quote, Andy would start most of the paintings. He would put something very concrete or recognizable, like a newspaper headline or a product logo, and then I would sort of deface it, and then I would try to get him to work some more on it, and then I would work some more on it. I would try to get him to do at least two things, you know? He likes to do just one hit and then have me do all the work after that. We used to paint over each other's stuff all the time." End quote. 
16 of the collaborative works were shown at the Tony Schifrezi Gallery from September to October 1985. However, overwhelmingly poor reviews led Jean-Michel to end the collaboration early. Although their friendship suffered as a result, Jean-Michel was deeply affected by Annie's unexpected death on February 22, 1987. He painted Gravestone in memory of his friend. On Jean-Michel's artistic technique, writer Glenn O'Brien said, quote, I never had any doubt that he was a genius, not after I saw him with a pencil in his hand. Watching him draw or paint was a revelation. It was conscious and automatic at the same time. He knew that at a certain point, art and music are magic. He had studied life drawing only briefly, but to say that he was self-taught doesn't quite capture it. He just seemed to know how." End quote. His friends remarked that he was constantly drawing, usually while sitting on the floor. One of them, visual artist popularly known as Fab Five Freddy, commented, quote, the way he would hold a pencil sometimes was like he was a cripple or something. He wouldn't hold it in a formal way. He would stick it through the fourth finger and look really awkward, so that when he drew, the pencil would just kind of slip out of his hand. He'd let it go that way, then grab it and bring it down, then let it drift. It was amazing, this whole dance he did with the pencil." End quote. Curator Robert Storr stated, quote, His graphic work attests to his manic haste. Scarred, torn, and trampled, much of his work on paper bears the direct imprint of his urgency. The seemingly throwaway sheets that carpeted his studio might appear a little more than warm-ups for painting, except that the artist did not in fact throw them away, but instead kept the best for constant reference and reuse." End quote. In his work, Jean-Michel used layering to accentuate words and imagery. He said, quote, I cross out words so you will see them more. The fact that they are obscured makes you want to read them. End quote. Likewise, when describing his painting technique, he stated, quote, I scratch out and erase, but never so much that they don't know what was there. My version of pentimento. End quote. Pentimenti are markings on a work that provide evidence of changes made to a print or a painting while in production, or even the complete overpainting of a previous motif. In cases of the old masters, such as Rembrandt, this occurs as a result of the aging of the piece, while for more recent occurrences, such as Edvard Munch, this is a deliberate choice. For Jean-Michel, the two motifs, former and over, exist analogous to one another. The effect is achieved through a harmony between transparency and opacity in the overpainting, as well as with the creation of scratches in the surface of the acrylic paint that he likely made with his fingers. The motifs he created explore a variety of subjects, anatomy, comics, history, especially the history of African Americans, money and capitalism, sports, particularly boxing, and work. Politics, too, plays a prominent role. His father remarked, quote, Jean-Michel was very bright, very social, and very politically oriented. He didn't have to politicize through a microphone. The works possess messages and speak for themselves, end quote. Towards the end of his career, several of his works also began emphasizing death. One in particular, 1988's Writing with Death, has since become a focus for the iconography and myth that has since built up around Jean-Michel after his untimely death. On August 12, 1988, Jean-Michel Basquiat passed away in his home. The autopsy report gave the cause of death as acute mixed drug intoxication. He was 27 years old. In the span of two to three years, Jean-Michel had gone from homeless to internationally known artist, which, while thrilling, must have also been overwhelming. Artist Julian Schnabel opined, quote, in modern times, there is for sure, whether you take Jackson Pollock, whether you take Vincent Van Gogh, a romance about the notion of the artist as a person, whose life is so intense that it's more than he can bear. And there is always the question of, is it a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy? And I think, particularly in Basquiat's case, he identified very consciously with these heroes who had tragic endings." End quote. Said school friend Martin Aubert, quote, Jean-Michel was covered with paint and shivering. He said, I'm on heroin. I guess you don't approve of that but I have decided the true path to creativity is to burn out." He mentioned Janis Joplin, Hendrix, Billie Holiday, Charlie Parker. I said, all those people are dead, Jean. He said, if that's what it takes." End quote. He became more reclusive and suspicious that the art world was building him up with the intention of tearing him down. 
Suzanne Malouk, a singer, artist, and Jean-Michel's former girlfriend, recalled, quote, the parasites came. Eventually, he became paranoid and started isolating himself, covering the windows of our apartment with black construction paper so that nobody could see in. He was worried that, as a famous African-American man, the CIA or the FBI would have him murdered. I expect that a lot of it had to do with the drugs, end quote. For a time, Jean-Michel could turn to his friendship with Andy Warhol, who was able to understand that level of fame and all that came with it. After Andy's death, drugs were a means of coping. Jean-Michel stated, quote, they tell me the drugs are killing me, and then I stop, and then they say my art's dead, end quote. In April 1988, his work was shown at the Vrej Bakumian Gallery. Pieces include Eroica 1 and 2 and Writing with Death. In May, Jean-Michel went to Hana, Mwai, Hawaii, where he had first set up a studio back in 1984. Of these final months, Glenn O'Brien wrote, quote, He made that last brilliant and stark show against odds he set himself. After a triumphal opening, he went to Hawaii and kicked the habit that would kick him back. He made a life's work in a decade, and then he stopped. Much is made of his supposed idolization of fallen black heroes, as if his end was self-willed. I knew immediately when he died that this would be the scenario used to explain him and control him. It's the nature of the media beast to simplify the complex beyond recognition or understanding." End quote. On August 19th, a private funeral was held at the Frank E. Campbell Funeral Chapel on Madison Avenue and 81st Street, attended by immediate family and close friends. On November 23rd, a memorial gathering at St. Peter's Church at Lexington Avenue and 54th Street was attended by around 300 of Jean-Michel's friends and admirers. His band, Gray, played music, and Suzanne Malouk gave a reading of Poem for Basket by A.R. Penck. Glenn O'Brien mused, quote, Looking at people looking at Basquiat makes me realize he made art for a much different reason than most of his peers did. He didn't make work for collectors, dealers, curators, or critics. He painted for the public. He didn't paint for those who would hold title to his pieces, but for those who would see them. That's what the great ones do. I wish he'd lived to see it. I wish he could see his shows now, how they draw crowds, and I know he'd like his prices. I think he'd like the fact that all these baskets and all those houses are being well cared for before they inevitably wind up in museums. But I would advise collectors not to put them in storage. They don't like that. They want air and light. They want to be looked at. They're alive. And there you have it, Dos Cabezas by Jean-Michel Basquiat. Thank you so much for watching. As always, thumbs up if you liked that video. To see future videos like this one, please subscribe. Comments and requests can be made in the comments down below. And if you so desire, I am over on Instagram. You can follow me at Rachel Paints Poorly. Until next time, bye. When Bruno Bischoffberger became his primary, bleh, I made it through Bischoffberger and I couldn't say primary.